Good day. My name is Giovanni Camacho Espasor. I am a professor of political science, international relations, and international law at the Department of Political Science in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities at the Mindanao State University in General Santos in the Southern Philippines. In this video, I will be talking about traditions and changing agenda of international relations. Let us define what does international relations mean. In 1780, English political philosopher Jeremy Bentham coined the adjective international. The neologism's purpose was to capture in a single word relations among nations. Although international literally means relations among nations, it has for most of its existence referred to relations among sovereign states. In Bentham's time, nation and state were often used interchangeably, so his meaning was closer to what we should call interstate relations. Ian Clark, in his Great Divide thesis, distinguished international from domestic politics. Other scholars, such as Kenneth Walsh in 1979, argues the difference between national and international politics lies not in the use of force but in different modes of organizations for doing something about it. So according to Walsh, these modes of organizations has two, or have two organizing principles, hierarchy and anarchy. Relations between units or actors are either hierarchical, involving clear lines of authority and obedience, or they are anarchical, involving no such lines of authority and obedience. There will be no other possibilities. The key, according to Waltz, is governance. Is there a supreme authority with the right to lay down and enforce the law? If the answer is yes, then we must be in the hierarchical realm of domestic politics, politics within the state. If the answer is no, then we must be in the anarchical realm of international relations, politics between states. In 1966, Martin White labels international politics as the untimely fringe of domestic politics. Here you can see the summary of the division between domestic and international politics. In the succeeding slides, I'll be talking each of these elements. Domestic politics is what takes place on inside of states, whereas international relations is what takes place on the outside, as if they are mutually exclusive realms. Domestic politics is premised on the presence of central authority or government that has monopoly control over the instruments of violence that can lay down and endorse or enforce law that establishes and maintains order and security, and that permits justice and peace to be delivered to the community of citizens. International relations is a negative image of domestic politics. By contrast with the domestic realm, international is premised on the absence of overarching authority or government that can lay down and enforce the law because the instruments of violence are dispersed and decentralized. This establishes ripe condition for insecurity, where injustice and war are permanent potentials and regular actualities of states. It is a world of friends and enemies where power rather than justice will determine international outcomes, and where states cannot afford to put their trust or security in others. States are trapped in a security dilemma where measures taken to enhance the security led others to take similar countermeasures and in the process generate further mistrust and insecurity. Perhaps the term that distinguishes international relations more than any other is anarchy. Anarchy, meaning the absence of rule but not necessarily disorder and chaos, has been the core assumption or presumptions and constitutive process or principle for much of the discipline's history. Richard Astley in 1989 has called IR the anarchy problematic, that is to say, a field of knowledge revolving around the organizing principle of anarchy. Let's talk about tradition of thoughts and international relations. During the discipline's early years, the dominant classificatory scheme was of idealism or liberalism on the one hand and realism on the other. This is how E.H. Carr in 1946 presented the field of study. Arguably, this scheme is still, domina still dominating the disciplines today in the United States, albeit in the revised form as a debate between neoliberalism and neorealism. 
It is vital to come to grips with these dominant IR theories, as they have largely set the parameters of the discipline, shaping its core presumptions or assumptions and key questions. Let's talk about realist thought. Realists argue that states exist in a condition of anarchy that comes or uh, that compels them to seek and to balance power to ensure the survival and, insecure, and security. They paint international relations as the tragic realm of power politics, where national interests clash and moral claims hold little sway. For realists, the character of international relations remain unchanged throughout the history. Mark McKenna Twaltz in 1979 uh, calls dismaying persistence of war. International relations in White's world, the realm of recurrence and repetition. Thucydides, or Thucydides, the great Athenian historian of the Peloponnesian War, brilliant Florentine diplomat and writer Niccolo Machiavelli, and towering English political philosopher Thomas Hobbes are canonical names in Realism's Hall of Fame. They not only provided insights into their own times, but also offered wisdom and insights that realists believe transcend time. In the realist view, if Thucydides or Hobbes were transported to our own time, they would observe nothing different other than names of actors. Liberal thought, on the other hand, emphasize humanity's capacity to improve. And it's more, it has more optimistic view. If realists see history as static or cyclical, liberals see it as progressive. So they tend to emphasize humanity's capacity to improve. They're committed to ideals and technological and economic as well as moral, legal, and political progress. That the world is anarchical and war prone is true for liberals as it is for realists. But the former believe it is possible and necessary for humankind to escape the Hobbesian state of war a condition in which states are insecure and constantly preparing for war. Strategies of peace, true law, and peace through commerce are dominant liberal approaches. In international relations, they see the gradual development and strengthening of international trade, international law, and international org organizations as the key to world order. Names in the liberal pantheon include great English political philosopher John Locke, John Stuart Mill, and the superlative philosopher of Conisberg, now called Kaliningrad, Emmanuel Kant. The third way is actually Marxism. It is, uh, it, this tradition shifted emphasis away from states to the historical development of capitalist system and the class conflict it generated. It re redirected the focus to an examination of how the twin logics of capitalist development and geopolitical rivalry interacted. It is worth noting that Marxism played a vital role in stimulating the critical theory because Marx critically analyzed the tension between hopes of universal freedom and concrete realities of inequality and oppression. Martin White labeled Marxism as revolutionism that is associated with the perpetual peace of liberal internationalism and the revolutionary internationalism of Marxism, the subversion and liberations and missionary men. So let's talk about Thucydides, the historian of the Peloponnesian War. The question is that, was Thucydides a realist? As an illustration of how traditions depend on interpretation, Consider the tendency of realists and others to assign Thucydides and critically to the realist tradition. Behind this assumption lies the supposition that realist tradition is centered around the concept of material or military power and that Thucydides is a realist par excellence. The one episode in his account of the Peloponnesian War that is always involved in the Milian Dialogue. According to Thucydides' narrative, the Athenian envoy says to his million counterpart, the strong do what they have the power to do and weak accept what they have to accept. 
captured in his remark as one of the most powerful expression of realism's emphasis on material power determining international outcomes, which is why it is realism's favorite hymn and why Thucydides is viewed as the first great realist. It would be a mistake, however, to suppose that Thucydides subscribes to the realist view since he is simply retelling story. In fact, much else in his na narrative suggests that Thucydides would be out of place if the realist tradition, but least because he placed a good deal of emphasis on normative standards for assessing conduct and moral responsibility. Furthermore, the Athenian Empire's reliance on military force and war proves insufficient to prevent an eventual collapse. We can conclude, therefore, that how traditions are understood and who is included in them is indeed a matter of selection and interpretation. So in the part two of this lecture, we'll be talking about changing agenda of international relations. Thank you so much for listening.